Hammer time. There was a guy that came in and graced me with his presence, and his name is the Atheist Hammer. He had a lot of objections, and his comments were very lengthy, and so maybe responding to them can help a lot of people out there. So, buckle up. There is no evidence, no facts, and no historical entries. The thing is, you kid yourself. The Bible was never meant to be a book. It was a bunch of stories put together by over a hundred goat herders until someone decided to use it as a scam. By someone, I'm assuming he means the Council of Nicaea and therefore the Catholic Church. The first Council of Nicaea, overseen by Constantine, was meant to address a bunch of discrepancies and discussions in the church at that time. This wasn't a session where they said, let's pick which books go into the Bible that we're making. It's rather, these people disagree with th these people, which disagree with those people, which disagree with those people. Who is correct? Let's take a look. And that's exactly what they did. They created a thing called the Nicene Creed, which a lot of churches still use today, and they publicly affirmed the deity of Christ. The second council of Nicaea, 400 years later, was a decision on whether or not to use images in the church. But also for this statement, he says, the Bible was never meant to be a book, but he also says, it was a bunch of stories put together by over 100 goat herders. Aren't stories you put together a book? And I assure you, if you were a true skeptic who followed the evidence, you wouldn't just abandon the scientific method. You concluded, then looked for supporting things. The scientific method can't be used to explain many different things. Here are five. Logical and mathematical truth. Science takes these as presuppositions in order to work in the first place. Metaphysical truths, like there are minds other than my own. Ethical beliefs. You can't use science to show whether the Holocaust was wrong, for example. Aesthetics. You can't use science to measure the beauty of something. Finally, science, ironically, can't prove itself. For example, in the special theory of relativity, the speed of light between two points in a one-way direction is assumed to be constant, but we simply can't measure that. The scientific method isn't the end-all be-all for proving things, and Christians don't abandon it to prove the spiritual side of life. It simply doesn't apply. If you do something in the name of your God, you do it to prevent you to going to hell and being tortured, and hopefully get a ticket to heaven, which makes everything you do selfish and self-centered. Atheists don't expect any sort of reward or evading from punishment for acts of kindness. Hell is not a place of torture, but of torment. That is a vitally important difference. Then I beg you, Father, he said, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also end up in this place of torment. Luke 16, 27-28 and as C.S. Lewis said, the gate of hell is locked from the inside. I do good works and sacrifice things for others in order to earn rewards in heaven, not to escape hell. My salvation is already secured in Christ. And anyway, how is sacrifice self-centered? As for death, I've experienced it three times and last time for one hour, 20 minutes. And the act of dying is painful and scary. Then your body floods you with a DMT tube hallucinogenic compound to ease the torment on your paralyzed body then nothing. It's that simple. I wouldn't say this is really an objection to Christianity, but just his point of view in life. I can't say for sure whether he experienced a near-death experience. Uh, and also, I would say it's a near-death experience, not actual death experience, because he's still here. Some people say that they've experienced death and that there's nothing after life. And some people have said that they experienced death and they saw God. We can't really tell based on those people's experiences, and their experiences don't have any bearing on the actual truth of Christianity. But for those who think that there is no afterlife, I'll, I'll ask this. What is the point to life if there's no afterlife? Is it the human flourishing Sam Harris talks about in his books? Because if that's the case, why are we so special? Why do we get to flourish over dogs, birds, or monkeys? One other thing, if you were raised in a Muslim country, do you think you would be praising the Christian God or Allah? There's people who grew up in Muslim countries and became apostates and left Islam. There's people who grew up in Hindu countries and converted to Christianity. There's people that grew up in Christian countries and are atheists their entire lives. That was me up to a certain point, and then I became a Christian. But it wasn't because of my upbringing. It was because of my own experiences after that. Where you grow up certainly has an effect on your background and your experiences in life, but everybody has free will to make their own choices, so... I chose Christianity. It wasn't imposed upon me by my country. And as always, you still didn't answer my question. What would you do if it was proven tomorrow that your god was a man-made wind-up toy for a way to subdue the populace and you couldn't deny the evidence? I answered this in a responding comment, but I'll answer it here for you guys. If Christianity was proved tomorrow that it was wrong, I wouldn't believe it. Why would I believe a lie? I'm trying to follow truth here. I happen to believe the evidence points to Christianity as truth, but if it didn't, I'd follow the evidence and go somewhere else. 
I am on a quest for truth, not a quest for happiness. This sentiment is even echoed in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 If our hope is in Christ for this life alone, we are to be pitied more than all men. What Paul means here is that if we want Christianity to be the thing that makes us happy on earth and that's all we care about, we should be the most pitiful men out there. The point of Christianity isn't to have a good life on earth. Now, that may happen for some people, but the point of Christianity is the afterlife, is what comes next. If you are really interested in truth as in factual reality and not what you want to be true, then be honest in your research. Look into the stories and the fact the Bible was edited and had a third of it removed. Replace the word God with the word king. Earlier he said that the Bible was only a collection of stories from a bunch of goat herders, and now he's saying that it's a book with a third of it removed, so I think he's kind of mixing his objections here, but for those of you out there, I'll cover the books of the Bible that people think were removed, but actually weren't. 1 and 2 Maccabees cover events that really happened, but are fallible writings, not the inspired word of God. The wisdom of Solomon contains good spiritual teaching, but it doesn't fit with the inspired nature of the other books of wisdom that we have in the Bible. The Gospel of Thomas is a forgery written in the 3rd or 4th century, and it wasn't written by Thomas. The early Christians nearly always rejected this gospel, since it claims Jesus said heretical or simply nonsensical things like, Every woman who makes herself male will enter into the kingdom of heaven, or Blessed is the lion that a person will eat, and the lion will become human. The Gospel of Barnabas was also forged, and the same can be said for the Gospel of Philip, the Apocalypse of Peter, and other similar writings. The Bible wasn't a book that was cobbled together by a small group of men in a room over a weekend, but rather a collection of writings that was affirmed by a large group of men representing a massively larger group of Christians the world over. It wasn't the Council of Nicaea that decided what was true and what wasn't. They were just affirming things that people had already believed to be true and not. And why would a super being design a cosmos just for us and a planet where bacteria are the perfect fit for the planet humans could barely survive on? 8% sounds like the perfect being isn't so perfect. And certainly the being would not be interested in what people wear or do with their sex organs. As such, a being wouldn't be male or female as they serve only one purpose. I think the finely tuned universe argument is actually an argument for God, not against. It's insane how small of a chance we have to be here, to be alive in the first place. And it begs the question, were we just a chance that happened, or we were actually put here in the first place? For the references to the Old Testament laws like you'd find in Leviticus, for example, there's reasons for them. The Old Testament is one long timeline of people rejecting God and God bringing them back to him, starting with Adam and Eve. The reason God made the Ten Commandments was so the Israelites would have guidelines for righteousness and so it would be clear to them that no one could meet God's standard. But the 613 total Old Testament laws were meant to govern the moral, civil, and ceremonial aspects of their lives. These laws were eventually upheld to such a strict degree that they became a burden on people instead of a guideline. The Pharisees were the religious and political leaders of Jesus' day and they were ruthless when it came to upholding the law. That's why Christ said this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead man's bones and every kind of impurity. In the same way, on the outside you appear to be righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Also, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Christ didn't come to abolish the old laws, but to fulfill them so that we don't have to fulfill them anymore and the Ten Commandments can be summed up thusly. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. The old laws no longer apply. And what makes your God more real than Odin's son or Shiva? Hinduism is like an old guy, Christianity is more like a teenager, and Islam is like a ten-year-old. The age of a religion does not make it right. The truth of a religion relies on the veracity of its claims, not on what people say or how long the religion has been around. I believe there's evidence to show that Jesus not only existed, but that he was sacrificed on the cross and that he rose again, and those three things together are what make Christianity true. I'm glad I live on an island where religion is nearly gone from day to day and my son's generation do not blindly believe what they're told. There are real Christians and there are fake Christians. Now, I can't speak definitively for any other person's salvation, but I can say this, that real Christians follow evidence, they don't believe this stuff blindly. Christians' basic fears are not being special creation. No. As the Bible says, 
Do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear the one who, after you have been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Christians fear, meaning we have awe for God himself, no one else. The universe doesn't care. Every person creates their own path. I agree. The universe doesn't care. God does. But if there was no God and the universe was all there is, then who's to say that I can't be preaching and evangelizing Christianity? It's just my own path, isn't it? If your brain cannot cope with how reality is and the large numbers it deals with, that shows that Christians are more like vines. They have to cling to others and their faith for strength, where atheists are more like trees setting roots and growing strong. There isn't much of a claim here except to say that atheists use reason and Christians use faith and therefore atheists are better, but everybody uses faith. You have faith that your friends will be your friends, that your family will love you, and that strangers will be kind to you. Faith doesn't mean blindness, it means trust. If you think about it, you are sort of an atheist, as the only difference is you believe in one God and I don't believe in any. I'm a married man. Does that mean that I'm a bachelor for all the single women out there, and that single guys just go one woman further? No, there's a difference between my wife and all the other women out there, and there's a difference between God and all the other gods out there. I'm committed to one woman for the rest of my life, not the other women, so there's the difference. In the same way, I'm committed to one God for the rest of my life, and not any others. That's the difference. This claim assumes that the evidence for all the gods is the same, but I don't think so. This whole time I've been saying, I'm a Christian because I follow the evidence, and I believe the evidence points to Christianity. I think it would be really useful if you saw the evidence for Christianity too. See this video over here for that. I'll see you next time.